want you to hit me as hard as you can. Two thousand and seventeen's Justice League, directed by Zack Snyder, a culmination of the DC EU that began four years prior with the release of 2013's Man of Steel, also directed by Snyder, was notoriously plagued with production problems. Firstly, the film was coming off of the lukewarm critical response, as well as underwhelming box office performance of previous film Batman v Superman, which was to be the grand introduction to the cinematic iteration of the famed superhero team. Things get even more complicated when, after a a family tragedy, Justice League director Zack Snyder had to step away from directing duties with Avengers director Joss Whedon stepping in to finish it. Now, HBO Max is going to be spending upwards of $30 million to release a Snyder Cut, to fit with his original vision while the DCEU cinematic universe is currently in flux. However, this wasn't the first attempt to make a Justice League film, and one of those versions, Justice League Mortal, from Mad Max Fury Road director George Miller, actually came really close to getting made around 2008, to the point where the entire thing was cast, there were costume fittings, and sets were even being built. I mean, it was shut down literally weeks before production. So how did it get there, and how did it fall apart? That's what we're going to find out in this episode of Movie That Almost Was. Now, before the big comic book movie boom post-X-Men in the early 2000s, when most people thought of the Justice League, this was usually the first image that a lot of people conjured up, even after the success of Richard Donner's Superman and Tim Burton's Batman. However, the Justice League itself had been around for a very long time, since pretty close to the inception of superheroes as a concept. In fact, the first iteration of the team, then called Justice Society of America, a precursor to the Justice League of America and then later just Justice Justice League came out as early as 1940, just two years after the introduction of Superman in 1938's Action Comics No. 1. And even though the JSA was cancelled in the late 40s after the end of the Golden Age, the Justice League proper was formed in 1960's Brave and the Bold issue number 28, in which the biggest superheroes of the Silver Age fought the dangerous giant alien creature Starro. The original lineup was the one ultimately used in Miller's film, which consisted of Superman, Batman, Aquaman, Flash, Green Lantern, Martian Manhunter, and Wonder Woman. Afterward, to capitalize on the group's popularity, there was the aforementioned Super Friends show, which debuted in 1973. This was followed by a barrage of subsequent Super Friends shows, which, starting in Challenge of the Super Friends in 1978, eventually introduced a larger superhero roster and most of the original team. But never Martian Manhunter for some reason, that is, until the Justice League cartoon in the 2000s. There was even a failed feature-length CBS pilot that was basically a shitty sitcom that never got off the ground, but which actually featured the first instance, and until the recent Supergirl series, the only instance of a live-action Martian Manhunter. Then, of course, came the 1978 Superman movie from director Richard Donner and star Christopher Reeve, which was the first instance of a big-budget, star-studded blockbuster superhero film. And it was a huge success. It was epic, action-packed, and even contained a rich emotion. Core. However, even with its immense success, Superman didn't seem to usher in any sort of comic book movie renaissance, with no other real blockbuster comic book movies for over a decade, besides Superman 2. That is, of course, until Tim Burton's 1989 Batman film. But even that film didn't really create the comic book movie renaissance we're currently living in, which wouldn't really come into its own until X-Men's unexpected success in 2000. Speaking of X-Men, this was also the first successful superhero group film, which meant that Justice League became a viable property to Warner Brothers for the first time. However, during the 90s and early 2000s, Warner Brothers was still in a weird place with its comic properties. Firstly, Superman had been a toxic property since 1987's disastrous canon film sequel, Superman 4 The Quest for Peace. But in the 90s, Warners tried desperately to find a way to get the Man of Steel back on the big screen. What initially really excited the studio was the success of the Death of Superman arc in the comics, which even got national mainstream media attention. Superman died Wednesday. 
East Greg Agnew reports on a world without the first superhero. It was a big deal. This led to the studio trying to make a film out of the concept, with John Peters, the producer behind the successful Batman films, working again with Batman and Batman Returns director Tim Burton on a Superman Lives film, who then cast Nicolas Cage in the title role. They also hired Kevin Smith to write the script, which then led to his famous onstage rant about the giant spider that Peters insisted on putting in the film. He's like, I got some directives for you if you're going to move forward on the process. Some things I want you to do and don't in the script. He's going, three things. Okay. I said, all right. He's going, one, I don't want to see him in that suit. Two, I don't want to see him fly. And three, he's got to fight a giant spider in the third act. <laughs> but it never came to fruition due to a variety of factors mostly cited to the dreaded creative differences. There was then an attempt to completely reboot the series with Superman Flyby from a script by J.J. Abrams that was a total reinvention of the mythos, which included a Krypton that didn't blow up, Lex Luthor cast as a government agent instead of a businessman or an evil scientist, and then the final twist that Luthor was in fact a secret Kryptonian that fought Superman in the last act. This version had Brett Ratner, then McGee, attached as directors at different times. That project too eventually fell apart. Then there were the various Batman projects that came and went. First, before Batman and Robin became the critical and financial bomb it turned out to be, it was expected that Batman Forever and Batman and Robin director Joel Schumacher was going to return to direct a fifth Batman film, tentatively titled Batman Triumphant, with the film's villains being Scarecrow and Harley Quinn. In this version, she was Joker's daughter seeking revenge instead of his lover slash henchwoman. It was even rumored that Schumacher was looking at the likes of Jeff Goldblum, Nicolas Cage, and Howard Stern to play the role of Jonathan Crane, aka Scarecrow. However, once Batman and Robin became the laughing stock it became, in a last ditch effort, Schumacher pitched Warners on a Batman reboot based on Frank Miller's popular Year One graphic novel. The studio liked the idea, but decided to do the film without him. They then tapped various directors, including the Wachowskis after the success of The Matrix, to take on the project, before eventually settling on the hot, up and coming director, Darren Aronofsky, who had just come off the dual successes of his dark indie films High and Requiem for a Dream. Aronofsky's Batman Year One film, which he co-wrote with Miller, took quite a bit of liberties from the graphic novel, including Bruce Wayne being poor for most of the film, getting raised by a mechanic named Big Al, and his Batmobile simply being a souped-up muscle car, which is an idea that seems to be resurrected in Matt Reeves' upcoming reboot with Robert Pattinson. Unfortunately, Aronofsky's vision of Batman was deemed too dark and R-rated for Warners. The studio eventually decided to give the year one idea to director Christopher Nolan. After the success of his dark indie thriller Memento, as well as the big budget studio thriller Insomnia he made with Warners, which starred Robin Williams and Al Pacino. This project eventually morphed into 2005's Batman Begins, starring Christian Bale as the eponymous Batman. But even before that, there was the idea of simply merging the two floundering franchises together into one film, which would have become 2004's Batman vs Superman, about 12 years before the Zack Snyder film of almost the same name. It was to be directed by Wolfgang Peterson, who was just coming off the success of Air Force One and The Perfect Storm, and the studio was rumored to be looking at Colin Farrell and Jude Law as Batman and Superman, respectively. Eventually, though, the versus idea was scrapped entirely, and Superman was given a solo film film, like Batman, but instead of a reboot like Nolan's Batman Begins, Superman Returns would be a de facto Superman 3 to the original Superman 1 and 2, retconning the original and actual Superman 3 and 4 out of continuity. It was directed by X-Men's Brian Singer in 2006, leaving the X-Men franchise to Brett Ratner, and leading to an unfortunately middling box office and critical success that led to no sequel and a complete reboot of the franchise less than a decade later. In the meantime, there were many attempts to get Wonder Woman off the ground, which eventually culminated in Josh Whedon taking a crack at it in the mid-2000s, getting so far as to release promotional material for a 2006 release, which obviously didn't happen. It was to be set in modern day, and unlike Patty Jenkins' ultimately superior version, included the invisible jets in the third act. But by far the worst DC film attempting to get developed in this period had to be the proposed Jack Black-led Green Lantern film from SNL alumni Robert Smigel. The leaked script for the film included things such as Jack Black's lantern creating green constructs of hot women to have sex with, a giant alien Pikachu as one of the final villains, because before Jeff Johns retconned the Green Lantern lore, their weakness was yellow, see? And at one point, Black's Green Lantern character created a literal green Superman construct 
to do the fighting for him. So, with the success of Christopher Nolan's Batman Begins making comic book movies viable for Warner Brothers again, even if Singer's Superman Returns wasn't the success that they were hoping for, they began looking for an idea to finally do Justice League and really take advantage of the superhero roster at their disposal, especially with how so many of them were ultimately false starts. So, in February 2007, it was announced that husband and wife screenwriting team Michelle and Kieran Mulroney were hired to write a script for a Justice League film. Afterward, the two would go on to write and direct Paper Man, starring Ryan Reynolds a couple of years later, and then write the story for the Power Rangers reboot in 2017. Their Justice League film was quite different in many ways from Snyder and Whedon's Justice League, and instead of delving into the New Gods canon, Miller's film instead was about the villains Maxwell Lord and Talia Al Ghul, played by Jay Baruchel and Teresa Palmer, respectively, using Batman's tech, played by Army Hammer, to attack the other Justice League members by exploiting their weaknesses that Batman had researched, as well as turning civilians into nanobot-enhanced attack robots called Omax. The film mainly took its inspiration from the comic book arc Tower of Babel, among others. Meanwhile, Jason Reitman, hot off the success of Juno, was the first director sought after by Warner Brothers to take on the Mammoth Project, but he backed out as he wanted to stay an independent filmmaker and not delve into blockbuster filmmaking. George Miller was then tapped to take the project, as he was much more comfortable with the large blockbuster scale. Now, while the successful Australian director was mostly known for his Mad Max trilogy of films at that point, Miller had most recently worked with Warner Brothers on their extremely successful, star-studded, CG-animated Happy Feet film about a dancing penguin ostracized for not being able to sing. So Miller had a lot of cachet with the studio, who gave him a $200 million budget to play with, and thus production on the film began in earnest in the summer of 2007. The director then looked at every young actor in Hollywood, eventually casting mostly relatively unknown young actors, which according to Miller was so they could grow into the roles in subsequent sequels. This included DJ Katrona as Superman, Megan Gale as Wonder Woman, Adam Brody as The Flash, Hugh Case Byrne as Martian Manhunter, Santiago Cabrera as Aquaman, and Common as Jon Stewart slash Green Lantern. Then Weta Workshop, fresh off The Lord of the Rings and James Cameron's Avatar were hired to do the effects for the epic film, and they immediately began work on the extensive costume and makeup effects. According to interviews with the cast and crew, things were going pretty well for a while. The cast were getting fit into costumes, and sets were getting designed and ready to begin construction. All the pieces were coming into place. That is, until production started hitting roadblock after roadblock, which ended up eventually derailing and ultimately killing the project altogether. One of the biggest obstacles, like most projects this size, was the budget. The film was exceeding $200 million as it was due to the extensive action scenes and set pieces, including an epic brawl between the Justice League and Superman, one of the few concepts lifted for the Snyder version. However, this film was way more epic and contained a scene where a mind-controlled Superman fought Wonder Woman on the motherfucking moon, as well as a scene where Common's Green Lantern created a green Superman construct with his power ring to fight off the real Superman, one of the only remnants left of the aforementioned failed Jack Black script, which could of course just be a happy coincidence, but if so, it's one hell of a coincidence. Unfortunately, a writer's strike happened right before production was set to commence, leading to more time and money wasted, as the actors' contracts lapsed and had to be renegotiated. Making matters worse, the Australian government eventually denied Warner Brothers the 40% tax rebate the studio was expected to receive due to not hiring enough Australian actors, even though a good percentage of them, including Megan Gale, Teresa Palmer, and Hugh Case Byrne, were Australian, as well as director Miller and the entire crew being Australian as well. This ballooned the budget from approximately 220 million to close to 3 hundred million dollars. Miller was quoted in an interview saying, a once in a lifetime opportunity for the Australian film industry is being frittered away because of very lazy thinking. They're throwing away hundreds of millions of dollars of investment that the rest of the world is competing for and much more significantly, highly skilled creative jobs. At this point, it was the summer of 2008, and while the production was moved to Canada instead of Australia to save costs, the final blow came when The Dark Knight ended up being a massive commercial and critical success, and Warner Brothers started getting cold feet about brand confusion. 
both Christopher Nolan and Christian Bale had expressed dismay about there being more than one actor playing Batman in theatres at the same time. Furthermore, Marvel had already expressed their unprecedented intentions for a shared cinematic universe, which would start with individual superhero stories which would then culminate into an epic crossover film. And with Iron Man also being a huge zeitgeist changing success the same year as The Dark Knight, the decision finally came to duplicate Marvel's cinematic universe model rather than forcing it into one film. And with that, Miller's Justice League was dead for good, and the rest is history. In the end, what do you guys think? And if there are any films that were almost made that you would like us to take a look at, please leave them in the comments down below. Thanks for watching.